Hey guys, my name's Sam and welcome to PrepMedic. In this week's video, I'm gonna show you how to combine two very simple vital signs to get a very important number for your patient. We're talking shock index. No, 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 I don't think this video will be long enough to justify that entire intro. So because I don't believe in leading you guys on, a shock index is very simply calculated by taking your heart rate divided by your systolic blood pressure. So let's dive into that a little bit more. So traditionally, we have looked at blood pressure and heart rate separately when we're trying to determine if a patient's in shock. An example of this is if a patient is tachycardic, so anything over 100 beats per minute is gonna be considered tachycardia. We might say that patient is in compensated shock if they have a normal blood pressure or a decompensated shock or decompensating shock if that blood pressure is falling below that 120 mark, 100 mark. Now, these numbers have not been combined and we don't really have a good way of quantifying them until now. Now, this scale is not the newest thing ever. However, I had never heard of it before I went into critical care and it is a useful tool for you guys. So what this does, like I said, it takes your, your heart rate and it divides it by your systolic blood pressure. And most of the time that should give you a decimal. So a normal shock index is going to be between that 0.5 and 0.7. All right, so let's do some really simple math here just to demonstrate how you can use this shock index. We'll take a normal heart rate, we'll say 70, and we'll take a normal blood pressure, 120. So we divide 70 by 120 and you get 0.58. That's well within your normal range for the shock index. Now the extreme of that, if you ever see a heart rate that's above your systolic blood pressure, you have a shock index above one. Now, this index is not super specific for mortality in patients. However, it does lead us to believe that these patients that are above a one or above a 0.7, I should say, are far more likely to be admitted to the hospital, have massive transfusions, and potentially go into surgery quicker. So this is just to get you thinking. Now, where I think this shock index is really, really useful is when these numbers get close together, but they don't quite cross. So let's say you have a patient with a heart rate of 90. That's still normal sinus rhythm. That's still within that 60 to 100 beats per minute range. And let's say they have a blood pressure of 100. Now that's a little bit hypotensive and it does largely depend on the patient's underlying physiology, but let's say a young patient that could be normal for them. But we put these together and now we have a shock index of 0.9. So while neither one of those vital signs in and of itself is telling me this patient's in shock, I'm looking at that shock index thinking something else might be going on. Our protocols specifically allow us to start blood transfusions if they have a traumatic injury and their shock index is elevated above that 0.7. I wanna reiterate that this shock index is most useful for your hemorrhagic shock patients. So this is a patient that's in a car wreck that has severe abdominal pain, might be bleeding internally, or maybe had a tourniquet placed after an arterial laceration of some kind, and you're trying to figure out if they do need that next step, that uh, increased intervention with blood products or surgery. Now, none of this should be taken as strict medical advice. I'm just some guy on the internet. You obviously have to follow your own department's policies and procedures. However, this is something you can put in your toolbox and just keep in mind the next time you have a severe traumatic patient. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments down below and I will see you next week.